In this video, we will work out some multiple choice questions pertaining to modeling functions. This is AP Precalculus topic 1.13 and 1.14. If you appreciate this content, please hit that like button. Number one, an open top box is constructed by cutting squares that are x by x inches from the corners of an 11.2 inch by 13.3 inch rectangular piece of cardboard and then folding the sides of the box up to make walls. The volume of the box is modeled by the function v, given by this expression. Which of the following statements is true about function v? Scanning through the answers, I notice that uh, most of the choices are about domain restrictions imposed by the context of the problem. So here's a picture of the situation. We have a piece of cardboard that is 13.3 by 11.2, and we are cutting out the corners. Uh, then we will fold up these flaps to form the open top box. But the size of the cutout is x by x. So what are the limitations? Well, if we make these cutouts bigger and bigger, eventually they will meet in the middle, and there will be no space left to make a box. You'll just have uh, cut up the piece of paper into four pieces. The limitation will be imposed by the shorter side because that's where the cutouts will sort of meet first. So the cutouts will have to be less than half the width of the shortest side. Half of 11.2 is 5.6. So cutout size x has to be between 0 and 5.6. Based on that alone, we know the answer will be D. The contextual situation restricts the domain of V to X is between 0 and 5.6. Now, what about this part that says the relative maximum value of V on this domain is 133.929? Even though we didn't need it to answer this question, we might need information like this to answer a future question. So let's follow through and use our graphing calculator uh, to find this relative maximum. This problem is calculator active. So let's go ahead and type in the expression for volume as y1 on the calculator. We just saw that the x values must be between 0 and 5.6. So let's adjust the window accordingly. Let's let x min be 0, and x max will be 5.6. What about y min and y max? Well, the volume can't be negative, so let's let y min be 0. And also, um, we see that the volumes, looking through the answer choices, are 133, 1,000-something, 1 2,000-something. Um, so we will adjust our y max accordingly. Since we suspect that the answer is D, let's go ahead and put in 150. And hit graph. All right, so this is the relative max that we're looking for. We can find this by hitting second trace and choosing the maximum option, option four. Left bound, right bound menu starts to happen. When it says left bound, we will move somewhere to the left of max and hit enter. And now it's asking for right bound. So let's move to the right of the max and hit enter. When it says guess, just move somewhere close to the max and hit enter. So we see the maximum value is one point, uh, sorry, 133.929 at two point something. So 133.929 matches option D. Number two, in 2016, the cost to mail a package was $2.54 for up to three ounces, plus an additional cost of 20 cents for each additional ounce or portion of an ounce less than a full ounce. A portion of the graph of this relationship is given with cost in dollars as a function of ounces. Which of the following describes the restrictions on the range for such a function? We can eliminate some of these options 
just based on the graph. So look at option A. The range is positive real numbers. So real numbers would include all of the decimals. So if that was true, we would have a smooth graph like this with no gaps. But the fact that we have uh, these jumps, these are like steps. And uh, let's, I'm going to zoom in closely. Um, these have little gaps between them. So we are not hitting all of the real numbers. So the answer cannot be A because of those, those gaps that we see. Option B says the range is positive integers. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. No decimals. But when we look at the picture, uh, we have, this is approximately 2.5, and then we have uh, 2 point something. We have all kinds of decimals happening. So we do have these jumps with gaps in them, but uh, we are hitting many values between 2 and 4. So there are definitely decimals involved. So it's not just integers. So the answer cannot be B. Option C says the range is values of the form 2.54 plus 0.2x, where x is a non-negative real number. So the key is we're talking about uh, all real numbers that are, that are positive, but real numbers. So that includes all of the decimals. So um, this is not going to be the answer because um, this is a linear expression like y equals mx plus b. Um, 0.2x, this is the slope of the line, and plus 2.54, this is the y-intercept of the line. But if we're going to do real numbers, okay, with all of the decimals included, we know what a linear equation looks like. So 2.54 might be right about here. And uh, so this would just be a smooth line like this. And that's not what we see. We see these steps and gaps. So it can't just be uh, a linear equation where we are allowed to use uh, all the real numbers, all the non-negative real numbers. The answer must be D. We will get this step pattern with gaps in between when x is only allowed to be a non-negative integer. All right, the key word here is integer because integers do not include decimals or fractions. So we're saying that uh, x is only allowed to be numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. without the decimals in between. So that's how we get this flat step pattern because we're only using specific sort of whole number values of x uh, without all the decimals in between. Number three, a music agent is planning a series of concerts at local farms around the nation. The agent is building a model to estimate crowd capacity based on different sizes of square fields, like this. Small, medium, large. Here's the stage. Which type of function is most likely to model crowd capacity in this situation? Well, the answer is going to be C, quadratic because the context involves modeling areas. And when we are modeling areas, that's going to be quadratic. If we were modeling volumes, for some reason, if these were cubes instead of squares, um, then it would be cubic. Number four, the table gives the average rates of change for the functions f, g, h, and k for certain intervals of x. Which of the functions is best modeled by a piecewise linear function with two linear segments with different slopes? We have to be really careful here. This table gives the average rates of change for the functions on each interval, not the y values of the functions themselves. So for example, when I look at function f, and I see that uh, these values are all very close to two, so uh, these values are about constant. So I'm thinking this is about, you know, something like this. 
That does not mean that f of x itself is constant. The rate of change is roughly constant. In the first half of the unit, we learned that if the rate of change is constant, then the function itself is linear. So f of x is linear, but it is not piecewise linear because it only has a single slope. Look at the rate of change of g of x. It goes 2 point something, 3 point something, 4 point something, 5 point something, 6 point something, 7 point something, 8 point something. So the rate of change is roughly linear, but that does not mean that g of x is linear. If the rate of change is linear, the function itself is quadratic. Function g is neither piecewise nor linear, so b is not the answer. The rate of change of h of x starts off 2 point something, 2 point something, 2 point something, and then jumps to 4 point something, 4 point something, 4 point something, 4 point something. So from 0 to 3, h of x has a roughly constant rate of change of about 2. And then from 3 to 7, it again has a roughly constant rate of change of about 4. On the interval from 0 to 3, h has a constant rate of change of about 2. That means that h is linear with a slope of 2 on this interval. And then on the interval from 3 to 7, h has a constant rate of change of about 4. That means it is linear with a slope of 4 on that interval. So the answer is C, because h of x is piecewise linear with two different slopes. For the sake of completeness, notice that the rate of change of k of x has two different linear intervals. Since the rate of change is piecewise linear, then k of x itself is piecewise quadratic. So that's why d is not the answer. Number five. At a bakery, the number of cookies baked each day changes based on anticipated demand. The scatter plot shows the change in hundreds of cookies baked from the previous day for eight days. The point at 2 comma 5 means that on day 2, the number of cookies baked will be 500 more than the number of cookies baked on day 1. A function model C is to be constructed for the number of cookies baked on each day 0 through 8. Which of the statements best supports the selection of model C? Be careful. The model C that we are constructing represents the number of cookies. This graph is not a graph of the number of cookies on each day. If so, we would be looking for a linear model, but that's not the case. This graph represents the rate of change in the number of cookies. See, it's the change in the number of cookies. Long ago, we learned these relationships. If the rate of change is linear, then the function itself is quadratic. So the answer is B. Because the information about rate of change is roughly linear, a quadratic model is best for C. Number six. The ancient Pythagoreans studied figurate numbers, which are numbers that can be shown by taking dots or spheres and arranging them into geometric shapes. For example, the square numbers are one, 4, 9, 16, 25, etc. And each of these numbers of dots can be arranged into a square. Like this. The tetrahedral numbers similarly specify the number of spheres needed to create a tetrahedron, which is a triangular based pyramid. The tetrahedral numbers are 1, 4, 10, 20, 35, 56, 84, etc like this. Which of the following statements is true? Look at option A. The tetrahedral numbers are best modeled by a quadratic function because the second differences are non-zero constant. And then scanning down the rest of the options, it's talking about third difference or second difference. So it looks like we need to figure out what the second and third differences are. From 1 to 4, that's an increase of 3. From 4 to 10, that's an increase of 6, etc. 
So these are the first differences of the tetrahedral numbers. If the first differences had been a constant, then the sequence would be linear. So far we know the tetrahedral numbers are not linear. Here are the second differences. If the second differences had been constant, we would know the sequence is quadratic. But they are not, so this is not quadratic. Because the third differences are all constant, the sequence is cubic. So the answer is D. The tetrahedral numbers are best modeled by a cubic function because the third differences are a non-zero constant. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, but also if you found this video helpful, there's a lot more where that came from. You can click the upper link, which will take you to the whole unit playlist, or you can click the lower link, which will take you to the next video in the playlist. See you there.